The sermon today is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 to 14. This is the word of God. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because there are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and the desire fails, because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of all vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goats, and like nails firmly fixed at the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond this. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deep into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Thus says the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Let us pray one more time for the preaching of God's word. Father, thank you that um, you've helped us go through uh, a difficult book, a wise book that has told us how to confront the harshest realities of life how to confront oppression and justice, how to confront hunger and need and the fact of death and aging now. Father, help us now see, Lord God, that the point of this passage is not ultimately just commandments about how for us to become wise, but it all points to the great Savior, the great shepherd, the great teacher, the great preacher, Jesus himself. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this is it. This is the last sermon in the book of Ecclesiastes. And on Next week, we're going to be starting a new series in 1st and 2nd Peter, so uh, hang on as we go into the last chapter here in the book of Ecclesiastes. We've seen um, in the last few weeks what the book of Ecclesiastes has been about. The book of Ecclesiastes is a wisdom piece of literature. In other words, it's a book written so that you might become mature in wisdom. And how it gets you to be wise, how it teaches you to be wise, is that it forces you to confront the harshest realities of life. It forces you to confront the fact that In life, you're going to feel a gap between what is and what ought to be. That in life, you're going to feel that reality isn't what it's supposed to be. That there's this pain and suffering and ongoing toil in this life, in this world. Um, And you feel, therefore, that life isn't ideal. Life isn't the way God has intended it to be. Life is suffering under the sun. And that responsibility and wisdom actually comes from voluntarily taking up the suffering. Voluntarily confronting these sufferings, voluntarily not becoming bitter and cynical because of the sufferings, but rather going through it and growing through it. And over and over again, one theme throughout the whole book of Ecclesiastes is that we are not in control over this life. We're not in control over the things that happen to us. We're not in control over the seasons of our lives. We're not in control over the sufferings and oppressions that we see outside of us. And ultimately, in this passage, we're not in control of the ends of our lives, and we're not in control over the fact that we're getting older and older, and God is. God is the one in control. He determines our lots, and and we don't have any right to determine our lots because we're, we're sinners in the hands of a just God. And because we're sinners in the hands of a just God, we're not innocent people entitled to good things from God, but rather we're, we're sinners living on borrowed capital. And there's going to be a time we're going to have to have uh, give an account to God for the fact of how we've lived under borrowed capital. We're criminals under borrowed capital. So in light of that, this is how the book of Ecclesiastes closes. It closes by reminding us that, friends, your time on earth will come to an end. And at the end of your life, Not only are you not in control about the fact that the end of your life is coming, the end of your life, there will be a judgment. And you're aging in this life as a reminder to you that there will be a judgment. And so so what should we do in light of that? So there are three things that I want to point out for today's passage. Three things here. 
First, that we're aging toward judgment, that aging as a process, the fact of aging is actually reminding us that there will come a time where everything will come to an end and we would have to give an account to a just God over our lives. There will be a judgment upon us. So first, aging toward judgment. Second, how to be wise in light of the fact that there is judgment at the last day. And third, we have to talk about the wise preacher and the wise shepherd here who is the ultimate author of the book of Ecclesiastes. All right, so first then, aging toward uh, 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 judgment, aging toward judgment. Look at verse 1 of chapter 12 of your passage here today. By the way, if you have a, a book Bible before you, I encourage you to keep it open before you as we go through this passage. Verse 1, aging toward judgment. Chapter 12 of verse 1 now addresses directly the youth here, addresses directly the young here. Let's look at what it says. Remember, this is the command, this is the imperative. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Notice here that the author is dividing your life up between youth on the one hand, the days of your youth, and then the evil days that come afterwards. So that there's youth and then there's old age that comes afterwards. And the fact that in your old age there are many years of it that are drawing near when you're young, and in these uh, years, you will say you'll have no pleasure in them. You're not going to take delight in the fact that you are existing in your old age. That's the harsh reality about aging. And this is actually continuing a theme over in chapter 11, the end of chapter 11, verses 9 to 10. So let me read this for you. Chapter 11, verses 9 to 10, at the very close of it, it says, Rejoice, O young man, so the youth again is addressed, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. So if you're young, enjoy it. Take delight in it. Make sure that you actually know how good it is, that, that you're young. Why? Well, walk in the days of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. To remove vexation from your heart and put away from your body, your youth, for, for youth and the dawn of life or vanity. In other words, he's saying here, delight in your youth, walk in the ways of your heart, enjoy it while you still can. Why? For youth and the dawn of life. In other words, youth and the beginning of life are vanity. They're fleeting. They're going to be gone before you know it. Uh, and remember in your youth that God will bring you into judgment. That's how verse 9 closes, right? So the author here is saying, while you're still in your youth, enjoy it, but realize that your youth is coming to an end. Your youth is absolutely fleeting. And in fact, when you're, you're, when you're delighting in yourself, remember that you have to give an account over your whole life, even while you're young. The things that you do in your youth will actually come back to haunt you especially as you're going to meet your creator in the last day. So in verse 12 again, notice that the author wants you to remember one particular attribute of God when, when you're remembering God in your youth. What is that attribute? The fact that he's your creator. And I think the youth are most tempted to forget that God is the creator because when you're young, you're going to have this illusion in your mind you're going to live forever, that life is just going to go on vigorously as if you're always going to be young, and that you're in control of your lives, right? Uh, like as if nothing that you ever do will affect your life ultimately. You're still healthy, you're still vigorous, and you could do well forever. But what the author here is saying is, well, remember, even when you're young, you're young your youth is coming to an end, you have no control of that. And remember that you are still not the one in control of your life. You might think that you are when you're young. But times are coming where you're going to be sorely reminded that you're not in control. You're aging. And God is your creator. And it is to him that you have to give your account of your life. So in verses 2 and 3 and so forth, all the way to verse 6, the author is giving you vivid imageries of what aging looks like. And it's utterly painful. Verse 2 gives us an image from nature what aging looks like, and then verse 3 onwards gives us images from home life, from domestic life, about what aging looks like, and the, the death that is ultimately coming to us. Verse 2, what does aging look like um, when you use nature as an imagery of it? This is striking. It says here, before the sun and light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. So at the end of verse 1, it says, the, draws are dr the years are drawing near where you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Well, what does those years look like? Why will you have not pleasure in them, no pleasure in them? Well, because it says here in verse 2, these years are like the sun and the light and the moon and the stars. They're darkening. And the clouds return after the rain. And that's a bit of a contradiction, right? Because you know in your experience of uh, rain, you know in your experience of storms, you know that uh, after the rain ends, the clouds disappear. 
Rain comes, the clouds disappear. In fact, normally the clouds come before the rain, and then there's rain, and then the clouds disappear after the storm. But the, in your years of aging, in your old age, it will feel like it's a storm, and the storm just happened. In other words, you're realizing you've grown old. You had a quarter-life crisis or a midlife crisis. You're like, oh my goodness, I'm old now. But then the clouds return after the rain. In other words, the rain ends, but the clouds remain. You realize you're old, but the crisis doesn't end. There's the psychological darkness that hangs over you. Old age, in other words, doesn't just happen and then it goes away. Old age comes to you and then it lingers before you. you you're stuck with it. You're, you're realizing now that I can't reverse this. There's no turning back from this. The clouds remain even if the rain has come and gone. And then in verse 3, it gives us an image from domestic life. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed. And the image here in verse 3 is of two genders and two levels of society, right? On the one hand, there's the keepers of the house and here, the Hebrew is actually masculine, so there's the male owners of the house on the one hand. They're starting to tremble. And then the strong men are bent. These are the guardians. These are the security guards. These are the laborers. These strong men are starting to bend. They're slouching and aging as well. So uh, rich, white-collared men are bending down, and the strong men who are laborers, they too are bending down. They're both trembling and bending towards aging. And then the grinders cease because there are few. And here... The noun, the grinders here, the, the actors here, are feminine. These are the, the milkmaids, the laborers who make the food daily. They are trembling because they too are getting older. And then those who look through the windows are dimmed. These are the wives, those who are richer, who are keep taking care of the household from the second floor. The ones that look through the windows are dimmed. So what verse 3 is saying here, all the way really to verse 6, is that no matter what area of life you're working in, what stratosphere of life financially you're in, uh, what occupation you're in, whether you have laborers before you or whether you're a laborer yourself, whether you're male or female, this is an exhaustive thing. Aging is coming for you whether you like it or not. And commentators have noted that these two images here, the, the darkness staying over you, right? The grinders here, they're not just images of real things in home life and in nature, but they're actually metaphors for the aging body, right? Uh, the keepers of the house, your cognitive faculties, your brain, they're starting to deteriorate. Uh, the strong men, your arms, they're bending now. They can't carry things the way you used to, no matter how many bench presses you've pilled the last few years of your life. The grinders here, your teeth, those that, that, that chew food, that's starting to crumble and fall away. The windows, they're dimming, right? Your vision starts to fail. Uh, I remember uh, an old professor of mine who just turned 50 in one particular class. Uh, he says that it's interesting to him that between ages 10 to 25, when he was still young, in other words, between ages 10 to 25, seemed like it's four times longer than his ages between 25 to 50. So it seems to him that when he's, you know, 25, all the way until now, he's 50 years old. He says, my life just seems so quickly. It's just passed over so quickly. But between 10 to 25, every year seems so long. Like, why is that? Like, my life has just gone by in a flash. My kids are in college now. He's just kind of realizing in between class that he's, he's having a little bit of a midlife crisis, right? Like, where did my years go? And not to get too morbid uh, before you hear. So after that class, I went out and researched a little bit about this. This was like six years ago. Um, I was like, why is that the case? Why is it that every year do you realize that your, your years just go by quicker and quicker and quicker? Like when you were 11, everything seems so significant. And then now suddenly it's just another year, it's just another year. And everything just kind of seems like blurring together. Well, it turns out not to get too morbid here. But actually, when you get to 25, here's just a sad fact. Your body starts to deteriorate much quicker than it's regenerating itself in the literal sense that your cells are dying quicker than your cells are regenerating into new cells. That's just a fact of life, that after you're 25, your body is really slowly beginning to deteriorate. Tim Keller gave a beautiful analogy of this. Again, he, he qualified this, not to get too morbid on you. But, you know, if you put a fresh piece of chicken on the kitchen, fresh piece of kitchen, you just took it out of the oven, beautiful piece of uh, chicken, right? A uh, whole chicken right there. It smells wonderful, smells beautiful. It can still smell the butter, the thyme, the rosemary. It's wonderful, right? And then he says, well, what if you just left that piece of chicken overnight? Hmm, it's starting to get a little bit dry, weird, and a little bit. Well, what if you, you left it over a week? 
Okay, flies are starting to come over. Well, what if a month comes by and then a year passes by and there are rats there and then maggots are coming out and stuff like that. And you know what Keller says? And this is Tim Keller, not me, okay? So blame him. He says this. That's like us, but in a sped up way. You realize that when you're sitting here, one day you are going to return to the dust. One day our bones will rot. And friends, if you're 25 this year, it's all downhill from here. It's all downhill from here. And you can't control it. You know, all the anti-aging products that you want to buy, all the times that you are wanting to go to the gym, all the gains you want to get, oh, men, right? I just saw a picture on Facebook last night of, of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was in his 20s and Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was in his 70s. And it's a meme. And he says, gym rats, remember, no matter how hard you work out, aging is still going to come to you. Working out is the, the highest example of the law of diminishing returns, right? The more you work out, it doesn't get any easier. You might think to yourself, I've been doing this for 15 years now. It doesn't get any easier. And here's the image of it. Your arms are bending. Your eyes, their vision, they're, they're going. Your brain, your memories, they're fading. Everything about you is winding down and slowing down. Why? It is to remind you that you're not here to live forever. You're not eternal. You're not a creator. You're a sinner living on borrowed capital. And God has already determined your lot. And what's your lot? Genesis 3.19. From dust you came and to dust you shall return. Death is coming for us all, friends. And if death is coming for us all, what is the point of aging? What is the purpose of the fact of aging? Well, again, look at the, the last verse of the book of Ecclesiastes. For God, verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Verse 14 of chapter 12 is simply echoing verse 9 of chapter 11. Remember who your creator is. And the fact that you're aging should tell you again, you're not the center of the universe. We are not the determiner of our, of our, of our destinies. We're not the captain of our fate. God is, and he's already determined it. And in the last day, he's going to ask you, he's going to beckon the criminal back. What have you done with your borrowed time? What will you do? What will you do? And what, how is your life going to be evaluated by God? Oh, so that's the first point. Reckon with that. Your life is fleeting and death is coming. And, and God will render judgment upon all of it. So what do we do? If the fact that there is judgment coming, if we're aging towards judgment, how do we then live wisely in light of the fact that there's judgment? Well, let's move on now to verse 9 onwards. How... Second point, how to be wise in light of judgment. And there's three sub-points here under the second point. How to be wise in light of judgment. Three things you want to point out here. How to be wise in light of judgment, you got to do these three things. And they all kind of coalesce and come together. First, you have to attend to the words of wisdom, the words of God himself, the words of God in the scriptures, the words of wisdom. you got to keep his commandments, secondly. And third, you have to fear God. First, attend to the words of wisdom. Second, keep those commandments. And third, fear God. And they all, again here, come together. Look at verse 9. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. And the words of the wise are like goats, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings they are given by one shepherd. So first, attend to the words of wisdom. Notice what is the work of this preacher here that has wrote the book of Ecclesiastes for us and for us to become wise. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The imagery here of what the preacher is doing is not unlike the lawyer who is weighing and arranging the laws of the land, making sure that he understands not only the content of the laws, but the logical ordering of it all. The preacher's responsibility is to attend to the law, to attend to the Proverbs, to study it with great knowledge, and to deliver it to the people, weighing and arranging and studying them with great care. And notice, therefore, just as a side note, right? notice the preacher needs to teach these things. The preacher or the teacher's job over the churches, over the synagogue in the Old Testament period is to actually teach you knowledge, to arrange these words of wisdom with great care, to actually present these things to you so that you too might weigh and study and arrange these proverbs and to apply them in your lives with great care. But notice, if you need to be taught something, it's not natural to you. You do not know God innately. 
Knowledge of God and knowledge of wisdom is not something that you can simply intuitively make up for yourself. In other words, if you want to grow in wisdom, you have to attend to the words of wisdom. You have to attend to the words of knowledge. You have to be taught these things. And this is counterintuitive for a lot of us because I think of a lot of us, we've kind of siphoned off theology and biblical knowledge into this spiritual realm that isn't at all the same as all the other spheres and sciences, right? Like, we would have a huge issue if we went to the dentist and then we realized the dentist never went to a school of dentistry. Like, you're going to drill my teeth? I want to make sure I see that you've gotten all the degrees, you got the certifications, people have recognized your work, right? You know? And then suddenly, you go to church on Sunday and you're like, the preacher just decided he's going to tell us what he dreamt of last night. No problem. That's a spiritual man. And we're thinking to yourself, why is that? Why have we siphoned off spiritual things and the words of wisdom in scriptures as if it's this spiritual, ephemeral realm that has no real academic application whatsoever and no strenuous strength is needed to learn it? But then when we go to the doctors of our bodies, we really care whether or not they've, 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 they've learned their stuff. We've bought into this modern dichotomy that somehow faith is personal, subjective, and it's all about feelings. Whereas the body of the science, that's public knowledge, that's truth knowledge. And that faith is more authentic the less you've studied. I've lost count of how many times when I've told people, oh, you know, what do you study in your postgraduate work? Oh, theology. Oh, be careful of the books. They're going to really corrupt your knowledge here, you know. You, you want an untainted knowledge of God. You got to just study for, you just, you just need to pray. Friends, if you're praying all you want and you're never studying the Bible, you don't know God. Let me just be clear. God is not a projection of yourself. If you're, if you're not studying the Bible and you claim to know God, you have no basis to say that God is someone that you actually know because this, this works in every kind of human level, right? How can you claim to know somebody if you've never learned about them before? How can you claim to know a subject if you never actually went there and, and experienced it and looked at it for yourself before? Friends, the preacher's job is to teach you knowledge that you don't know naturally and innately. Because not only are we finite and God is transcendent and we need to learn from God's revelation, but we're also sinful. We don't know the words of wisdom innately. We don't know what God is like innately. We need revelation. We need responsible teachers. We need to be taught ourselves. We need to learn from the scriptures to arrange these things so that we might become wise. But not only is this supposed to make us wise, the preacher also said that these are words of delight. You got to find and realize and be convicted of the fact that uprightly, these words of truth in verse 10 are at the same time words of delight. Notice that, right? When you're studying these things, these laws, these rules, these words of wisdom from scripture, they're not meant to make you bored. <laughs> they're not meant to make you dreary and dry and, and you know, all uh, 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 all bored all the time. and make, You're actually supposed to see that these are words of delight. Let's just take the Ten Commandments because the second thing that you need to know here, right, is to keep his commandments. That's how you live wisely in this world. Keep his commandments. Realize that these commandments were written not just for your wisdom, but for your delight. And deep inside you know that. Just take one of the commandments. You shall not lie. Don't bear false witness. You know that a lie distorts reality, right? And not just a lie distorting reality, they could really hurt somebody. Why is gossip so evil and so bad? Because you realize that gossip is people saying behind your back what they would never say in front of you, right? Gossip is people perpetuating half-truths, false truths about you uh, that they would never say in front of you, all to slander you behind your back so that your reputation gets worse and, and it puffs themselves up because they make, it makes themselves look better than you. Gossip creates misery, right? And gossip is a violation of the commandment that you shall not bear false witness. Well, what about you shall not commit adultery? You know, when we think about that commandment, we normally oftentimes think about, so it's just a rule, and now we just got to think about what not to do, right? Don't look at pornography. And if you're dating here, you're like, oh, how far is too far, Gray? Like, you know, what can I do? What can I not do to, like, not violate this commandment? We just think about what not to do, and we, we make them into small little rules. But it's striking to me, as we studied Luther's catechism for a Paideia reading group uh, yesterday, right, we went through Luther's exposition, Martin Luther, the, the German reformer in the 16th century. His exposition of this command, do not commit adultery, is what? 
he spent almost none of the time on rules of what not to do. He spent all of his time on the beauties of marriage. Why should you not commit adultery? Because marriage is worth it. Because marriage is beautiful. Because there are joys in marriage. And there's a purity in marriage. And there's a, a beauty in marriage. There's a sanctity in marriage that you don't want to spoil. So why don't you commit adultery? Because marriage is a gift of God. Why should you not lie? Because people are made in the image of God. Why should you slander them? Why should you not steal? Because that hurts people. You should love them. You should care for them. You shall not take away from them what doesn't belong to you. Right? Why should you rest and keep the Sabbath day? Because your body's needed. The Sabbath day was not made for God, but made for man. These are words of the light. These are things that you know deep inside, Christian or non-Christian, that if you keep these commandments, you would actually be happier. You know this deep inside. But yet, right, yet, look at verse 11. And the words of the wise, they're not just words of delight and words of truth. They're also goats uh, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings as they're given by the one shepherd. As we're considering the words of wisdom, as we're considering keeping his commandments, right, we realize not just that they're actually supposed to give us delight, but when we consider them, we find them to be like nails piercing into our flesh. And it's really, really difficult to obey them. And it looks like a, a really dreary law, a burden on our backs, and it's really difficult for us to follow them. Not only are they difficult for us to follow, but I think deep inside we've also realized that a single look upon these commandments, we know we've failed. We have failed every single one right? Uh, don't take the name of your Lord in vain. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't make graven images of God. Uh, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love, love your neighbor as yourself, in other words, right? We know that deep inside, we fail at these things. We haven't made progress in how to obey these things. We don't know exactly how to obey these things. And by the way, this is why in verse 12, the preacher here is attacking the academic directly. Look at verse 12. I can't help but take this personally. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. In context, what's, what's, what is this saying? What's verse 12 saying in light of verse 11? He's saying here, look at the commandments. Try to keep them, all right? Like, just try to keep them. Yes, be wise. Go study books. Go study the scriptures all you can, right? Study the Hebrew. Study the Greek. Study all these things. But the moment you look at the commandments, remember of how they limit you, right? Don't go too far. Don't, in other words, don't get your head up in the clouds and puff yourself up that if you know all of the words of scripture, that you could obey them. Beyond these, beware. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. In other words, you, know, you could study all you want, but at the end of the day, you can't even do the most basic things of the law, right? Uh, back when I was an undergrad and I had started to get a thirst for academia and things like that, I had this romantic view of my professors. This like a romanticized view of my professors where like, my goodness, they seem to know so much and they're so wise and they're spending all their time reading and writing books and stuff like that. And I was like, yes, this is glorious, this is beautiful. If I could just, just become more like them, Life will go well for me. You know, they're, they're, they're awesome. They're incredible. I had this romanticized view of the academic life. If I could just know as much as they do, life would become better for me, right? So last year, I had my Viva, and I passed my PhD thesis. They examined me for two hours. They said, pass. And I went out, and I went to see Indita, my fiance. Just, she was just sitting there waiting, and then a lot, bunch of people were waiting for me. They congratulated me. And I went out, and I remember thinking, oh, life isn't any different. <laughs> And uh, one of the guys asked me, like, how do you feel now? And I remember I told him, I don't feel any different, and I'm still a sinner. <laughs> like, life hasn't changed for me. I still don't know how to honor my parents best. I still don't know how to, how to keep my tongue from slandering people really well. I have no clue how to make sure that my words are always precise and they hit things just exactly the right time and make sure that I don't offend anyone unnecessarily. I have no idea how to not take the name of God in vain because I'm sure I say wrong things about God all the time. I have no idea how to love people around me and at the same time rest well and keep a work-life balance and keep the Sabbath holy, right? 
I could parse all the Greek verbs I want, study all the ancient Dutch literature I want, but then I read the Ten Commandments, I'm just a baby like you are. I'm like a baby like anyone else. I know nothing before the Holy God. And that's why, friends, the third thing you got to realize is as you consider these commandments, fear God. Look at verse 13. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. When you're starting to realize, okay, the words of God I've got to study. And at first they give you a little bit of delight because you're starting to realize now if I follow these things, this is the way to a happy life. But then you realize, I can't do them. I can't do them. And then you realize again that God is going to judge you. The only logical and appropriate response is total and utter fear. Fear before a holy God. Because now you're looking at the law and you're looking at yourself and you see this huge gap. And you're realizing that judgment is coming. And this is, I think, friends, the main problem of modern-day religiosity. There's a lot of talk about the love of God. There's a lot of talk about God being our friend. But there's no, not much talk about the holiness and the justice of God such that we can go on life simply assuming that God is on our side without first thinking about the holiness of God that should cause us to really tremble inside. That every sin you've ever committed, God could strike you right then and there, and you would have died and God would have committed no injustice. So that the first thought in your head shouldn't be, why should bad things happen to me? Well, why do good things keep happening to me? I sin every day against you, God. Yet at the same time, I'm alive and breathing. Here I am, waking up again. Why am I still alive? Why didn't you strike me dead in my sleep? Fear God. So when you consider the commandments, your instincts now can't be, God is my friend. God, you're a holy judge. You're a holy judge. And what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? So friends, before I get to the third point, right? And if you've been going to CCC, you know where I'm going. Before I get to the third point, I hope that you're seeing, and as you take away our, our, our sermon series, the book of Ecclesiastes, I hope you've seen that again and again. When you come to the Bible, when you come to the scriptures, when you come to church, realize that our task here isn't simply to tell you that the Bible gives you commands about how to live. The book of Ecclesiastes is not about you. The book of Ecclesiastes is not primarily about, here are the things that you could do to please God, now do them. Here are the ways to get wise, now do them. The book of Ecclesiastes, just like every other book in the Old Testament, and most books in the New Testament, is to remind you again and again, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't become wise in your own strength. Solomon, the one given wisdom himself, can't do it. You need someone else. You need a substitute. So third, let's consider now, from this text itself, the wise shepherd and preacher who took our place. Because notice here, in verse 9, it talks about the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many prophets with great care. Notice that in verse 9 of chapter 12, the author actually changes perspectives, right? Before this particular verse, before verse 9 in chapter 12, you see this first-person perspective. You see the author telling you, I have seen great oppression. I have seen great injustice. I have tasted many pleasures. I have seen and investigated these things for myself. In other words, before verse 9 of chapter 12, you see this first-person language talking to you. Uh, my son, listen to this. I have looked at these things. Here's what you need to do. Uh, I will tell you now what how, and how to live, right? But in suddenly in verse 9, there's a switch in perspective to the second and third person. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. It's almost as if there's a commentator narrating what just happened. Here's a third person perspective I'm not telling you. Okay, you've heard the preacher. Now let me tell you and let me commentate about what the preacher just said. So there's a third person perspective. But notice as well, not just that there's a preacher and then there's a commentator. And then at the same time, there's this awkward saying in verse 11. These words, these collected sayings were given by one shepherd. And you're like, I haven't seen a single shepherd reference in the whole book. No sheep, no shepherd, nothing about that. I've seen, about, I've talk, I've seen talk of kings. I've seen talk of peasants. I've seen talk of, of, of laboring, but not really talk of shepherd. And when you take a look at the book of First Kings, where the life of Solomon was given to you, right? You don't see Solomon becoming a shepherd, ever. So did Solomon write this book? 
You know, who is this preacher? Who is this wise person who's saying this book? And who's this commentator here? And at the same time, who's this shepherd all of a sudden? The only shepherd that was really prominent before Solomon was David. Right? So there's this ambiguity in this passage about who the author exactly is. Who's this preacher? Who's this commentator? Who is this shepherd? And maybe the point of the book of Ecclesiastes is to tell you here right and now, not that Solomon is your greater example. Go be wise like Solomon. Maybe the book of Ecclesiastes was ultimately written by God, telling you not exactly the precise details of the author, who the author is, because it doesn't want you to know who the precise details of the author is. It doesn't want you to focus on who the author is, who the human author of this author is. It wants to point you that there's somebody who's going to be a preacher, who knows the plans of God, who can see the preacher from a third eye perspective, and at the same time, who is a shepherd. Who in the world is this, sh- is this preacher shepherd who at the same time has an omnipresent narrator-like voice? <clears throat> who, if not Christ himself, 2,000 years after this book was written, right? There is the word of God himself, the wisdom of God himself, who is the light of the world, who knows everything that has ever come to pass, who has seen the, the world from above to our perspective, who is wisdom and God, the Logos himself. He took on flesh, and he was a preacher. He arranged words of wisdom. In the book of Luke, and in the first few opening chapters, he was a child, and he was sitting in the rabbi's feet, learning from the scribes and the Pharisees, and actually overturning the tables before them. He was strenuously a man of the law. And when he was starting his public ministry, he arranged the words of wisdom and God himself and spoke it back to the devil. He was the one, in other words, who was called the scribe, the the, the teacher, the rabbi himself. But at the same time, as we saw in the book of Ecclesiastes, he wasn't just a serious rabbi. He also seized the day. He was faithfully playful with the children when they came before him. He enjoyed uh, uh, the, the, the friends of tax collectors, the friendship of Pharisees, and the friendship of prostitutes. He was in lavish dinners, and he didn't excuse it as if that was below him or something like that so here in jesus christ you have this preacher this shepherd who sees the day like the book of Ecclesiastes did and here in this great shepherd you not only see this this strenuous students and the one who enjoyed life you also saw someone who obeyed the commandments of god perfectly and who loved his church perfectly Because why? In chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes, what did he say? Love your wives in all the days of your vain life. And Jesus didn't have a wife. He had the church. He loved the church all the days of his life. And he accepted the sinner's lot even while he was not a sinner himself. He died well. Precisely because his goal wasn't success or glitz or anything else. His goal was simply faithfulness and accepting the slot of God as a shepherd. And by the way, for 30 years of his life, he was simply a carpenter. If you're thinking to yourself, what does wisdom look like? What does a wise person who's divine would look like? What kind of image comes to your mind? Does it come to your mind that this would be a shepherd for 30 years simply staying quiet and learning the scriptures? He accepted the sinner slot accepted the fact that his lot in life is to simply be a carpenter and then suddenly to die a shameful death simply for the love of his church. This is the great shepherd here, friends, that is spoken about in verse 11. The nails now that he knows that you felt from the words of the law are nails that have gone through his hands. And this great shepherd has said as himself in John 10, 11, I am the great shepherd and the great shepherd will lay his life down for his sheep. That's you and me, friends. And all the book of Ecclesiastes, especially in a lot of the New Testament, here is the main takeaway. The end of all the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And Christ has done that all for you. Trust and believe in him, the great shepherd of your souls. Let us pray. Father, the message of the gospel is that wisdom took on flesh because we were not able to become wise ourselves. Wisdom studied the law because we couldn't study the law to its depths. Wisdom took on the nails that should have pierced us 
upon his own hands and feet so that we, shouldn't, we wouldn't die the death that we deserve, but rather someone else died in our place. So Father, help us see the beauty of substitution, the beauty of the gospel, and help us believe in it. Before the throne, we have a mediator, a great shepherd, a great high priest. And let us uh, say amen before the Lord. Amen.